Hello, my name is Gideon Cordova and this is my two cents adjusted for inflation. Today, I'd like to talk about a progressive vision for the economy and for the society at large. Right now, we live in what is fundamentally a neoliberal era. There's this permanent belief that spread from all sides of politics that the economy is somehow a deity that we all must serve. There's a belief that even if it comes at the expense of the planet or the people, we have to serve the economy. And if the economy is sick, then we need to face austerity in order to help the economy become better again. Well, in fact, a progressive view of the world would recognize that the economy is something that was invented by us. And if we want to, we can manage it. We have to recognize that the planet is the overwhelming real resource that we have at our disposal. And indeed, at the moment, we're disposing of it. We need to recognize that human beings have an obligation to make sure that the planet is in its best health. We have an obligation to make sure that the people that coexist within our societies are treated fairly and with dignity. And we ultimately need to recognize that we should form and control an economy to serve us and to serve the public purpose. Are we in Australia running as efficiently as we could be? Are we the society that we want to be? Well, as I speak to you now in March 2017, there are currently 750,000 Australians who are unemployed. Importantly, there are over 1 million Australians who are underemployed. That is, they wish that they were working more hours for better money. So, if there are that many people, more than 1.7 million, who aren't working as much as they would like to or aren't working at all, can we really call ourselves an efficient economy? It's important that we start to tackle the economic mainstream narrative that is focused on the narrow interests of profit-seeking individuals. Rarely do mainstream economic arguments ever focus on things that are either not quantifiable, like the aggregate uh, environmental degradation, or things that aren't private. For instance, how is society doing? We focus instead on gross domestic product. That is the aggregate a number of transactions, the total worth of those transactions in a given economy during a given year. Well, that's one reasonable measure of looking at things, but as the old adage goes, garbage in, garbage out. The model is only as good as the set of assumptions upon which the model is based. So thinking of GDP, every time a pharmaceutical firm raises the price of pharmaceuticals, that's considered because it's an increase in their uh, total number of transactions and total amount of money uh, being given and taken during those transactions, that's considered as an increase in GDP. So a concrete example of that is when Martin Shkreli, as the CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals in the United States, raised the price of a life-saving medication by 5,500%, his company made more money. And having made more money, that was then registered in turn as an increase in the United States GDP. Equally, when we pay interest payments to our bank because the bank makes more money, their bottom line goes up and in turn, our GDP is registered as being on the increase. But it doesn't recognize what an extractive force that actually is. Consider it this way. Every time you pay interest payments to a bank for th their purposes, that's money that could be spent on real goods and services in the real economy. Every time you pay that interest payment, that $100, say, in interest payment is coming at the expense of $100 that you could have spent buying clothes or petrol or food, shopping at your local supermarket. So we need to start reassessing our economic narrative to take into account what are fundamentally extractive forces as opposed to what is productive and what actually takes place in the real economy. Take the concept of demand. An economist will tell you that demand is when a person has the willingness and ability to pay for a good or service. Well, a homeless person might be very willing to pay for crisis accommodation, but they don't have the ability to pay, and therefore they're left on their own. If we decided to let the free market deal with homelessness, they would sooner build holiday homes for the holiday house homeless than they would build actual houses for the actual homeless. And the reason is that people who would like a holiday home but don't currently have one, 
will have the willingness and ability to pay for it, whereas the homeless person might have the willingness, but they certainly don't have the ability. So we need to discuss in a more reasonable way what issues do we think should be left to the free market and what issues should be taken away from the free market and delivered to democratic desire. For things like healthcare, education, national parks, and certainly dealing with crisis accommodation for the homeless, these are issues for which the democratic desire should take precedence over market forces. There really needs to be more accountability in our economic discussions. For instance, if an engineer designs, plans and builds a bridge and that bridge then collapses because of the engineer's negligence, that engineer could go to prison. When an economist designs a failed economic plan, there's no accountability, even though millions of people are impacted. Currently in Australia, there's more than 2.26 million people living in poverty and 570,000 of them are children. We know that there are massive intergenerational costs associated with unemployment and underemployment. These are things like social dislocation, crime rates, poverty rates, malnutrition, obesity, all kinds of issues that are caused as a result of social determinants, which are fundamentally inflamed by mass unemployment. There have been great public works programs that have created amazing projects that then delivered goods on an intergenerational basis. And a good example is the Great Ocean Road, which still delivers tourist dollars, but was in fact created as a means of employing the unemployed. Similarly, the Sydney Harbour Bridge and Pinnacle Road, which leads to the summit of Mount Wellington here in Hobart, was also designed as a public works program to help people who are unemployed find gainful employment. We need to start looking at different ways of measuring an economy's success. Rather than gross domestic product, we could look at things like the index of social health, which takes into account child mortality, old age poverty, health insurance coverage, education, crime rates, wages. We could look at the gross sustainable development product, which attempts to take into account environmental damage as a result of economic activity. The United Nations Human Development Index was implemented to emphasize that people and their capabilities should be the ultimate criteria for assessing the development of a nation, not economic growth alone. If we can have full employment and mobilize the productivity of a sovereign nation during times of war, why can't we do it during times of peace? If as a result of the Great Depression and then after World War II, we were able to mobilize millions of workers to participate in projects that left a lasting legacy of public good for the society, why can't we do it during peacetime? Why can't we do it again now? The economy is us. We create it and we should control it to serve the public purpose. My name's Gideon Cordova. Thanks for joining me. This has been My Two Cents, adjusted for inflation. I'll see you next time.